Here's video two of chapter six. And we're looking at the emission spectrum of an atom. So what we're looking at here is how atoms gain and lose energy and how wavelengths and light helps us to determine how much energy an atom is gaining and losing. So atoms give off line spectrum of discrete wavelengths. What that means is that atoms can only gain or lose very specific amounts of energy. And that means that you will only see certain amounts of energy emitted from an atom. I'll explain that as we go. So Bohr's theory was kind of the first understanding of the atom, and it's still fairly true. We'll talk about what things are a little bit different. But what Bohr thought was electrons in an atom can occupy only certain orbits. So here you see the nucleus with the protons and the neutrons. And then he said you have these orbits, which were kind of, it's almost like a solar system, where these were these areas or tracks where electrons were found. We now call these areas N equals one, N equals two, N equals three as you get further from the nucleus. We'll talk about this again here in just a few minutes. So electrons in permitted orbits have specific allowed energy. So the higher the N value, the further you are from the nucleus, the higher the energy of those electrons. And so as electrons jump around, the atom is gaining and losing energy. So here's my picture. If an electron, for example, hydrogen. Hydrogen only has one electron. His electron typically rests right here closest to the nucleus. If the hydrogen atom is given extra energy, the electron will jump out one or two or three levels, and that's energy being absorbed. The atom doesn't want to stay like that. So as soon as it can, the electron will go back down, and as it comes back down close to the nucleus, that's when energy is released and it's released in the form of light, which gives you different wavelengths based on the amount of energy you get, and therefore different colors. This brown is a child marking, so that's not important. Um, so energy is being absorbed as electrons jump out, and then energy is being released as electrons come back in. And I wrote that a little bit differently over here, just where if, in, if an electron's moving up these levels, energy is being absorbed, and when the electron's moving back down, it will emit light. So we have some calculations and equations that'll help us to figure out how much energy is being absorbed and released by an atom. We have some new constants. So there's Rydberg's constant, which is here. We have the Ni and Nf, which means these different energy levels, one, two, three, four, et cetera. You've still got Planck's constant and you still have sp um, speed of light. So here's those calculate the energy emitted when an electron moves from n equals 4 to n equals 1. So quickly, if I run over here to the equation sheet, you're going to see a couple of different equations that look similar. So you see here, you have two n values, meaning that the electrons are moving between ele energy levels, and here as well. The main difference is that this first one is used to determine energy that's been absorbed or released. The second one is used to find wavelength, because that's lambda right there, to find wavelength of the light that is being emitted. So you choose the one based on what you're trying to determine. Okay, so we'll see examples of both up here. Okay, so here we can see a couple of examples using those formulas. It says calculate the energy emitted when an electron moves from n equals four to one. So what that means is it's coming from energy level four out far from the nucleus down to one, which automatically means energy is gonna be released. So our change in energy is gonna be a negative value because energy is being released. If it was absorbing energy, that should come out to be a positive value. So here the equation tells me negative Rydberg constant, which is the 1.097, 10 to the seventh. H is Planck's constant the 6.63. C is um, speed of light, three times 10 to the eighth. And then you have one over the final n value squared minus one over the n initial squared. So final minus initial, meaning final was one squared and initial was four squared. And we get our energy to come out to be negative 2.05 times 10 to the negative 18th. The meters go away, the seconds go away, and you're left in joules for energy. Next, if we want to find wavelength, we use the one that's called the Rydberg equation, which all you really need to know is it's the one that's equal to one over lambda, 
because that's the one that's gonna help us get to wavelength. You still use Radberg's constant. You still use two n values, but it is different. This time we're always putting the lower n here and the higher n here. This is because wavelength has to be a positive value. It's never gonna be a negative wavelength. That doesn't exist. So wavelength is always the wave that's being either absorbed or released by the atom. And we always have to put in these ends correctly. So here, calculate the wavelength of light emitted when an electron jumps from n equals four to n equals two. So we have one over lambda. We have Radberg's constant. One over the lower n squared minus one over the higher n squared. Now, at first, we're gonna get this huge number, right? Two million something. But what you'll notice is that's equal to one over lambda, which means that's the inverse of the wavelength. So what we have to do is to get to actual wavelength, we have to raise it to the negative one power or do one divided by that number. So our lambda ends up being 4.86 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. That is the wavelength. We have one more equation that we work with a little bit. It's called the de Broglie equation. Really what it's saying is that when objects move, such as electrons, they exhibit wave properties. So they emit waves in a way, cause some disturbance around them. And the equation we use is known as the de Broglie equation, which is lambda for wavelength equals h for Planck's constant over mass times velocity. So it's determined by the object's mass and how quickly they are moving or spinning. The mass must be in kilograms because that's part of a joule. And the velocity has to be meters per second. That's because of all the surrounding units here. So here, find the wavelength of a 50 kilogram dog riding a skateboard at 20 kilometers per hour. We've gotta be careful about units. So we know that if we are looking for lambda here and we're using Planck's constant, we've gotta do uh, mass in kilograms, which is already good. <clears throat> Planck's constant, obviously already good. But what we do have to do is take this speed or velocity and convert it to meters per second. So as a reminder how to do that, kilometers per hour, kilometers goes on the bottom, a thousand up top. Hour is on the bottom, so we bring hour to the top, 60 minutes, one minute, 60 seconds. So we've done this of earlier chapter. You end up multiplying everything on the top, divided by the bottom, we're left with meters per second. Everything else cancels out. And so we can plug that velocity in and we get the wavelength that that dog would create. And then I ended up rounding it to one sig fig in the end because the 20 and the 50 only had one sig fig. And then one more similar, which is more what we're referring to here as an electron that's acting as a wave. Um, find the wavelength of an electron, which here's his mass super tiny, it's already in kilograms, so it can go straight in there. We've got Planck's constant, and it's moving at this given speed, which is already in meters per second. So it just becomes a correct calculation here, making sure to put it in our calculator correctly, and here's our wavelength created. So Bohr's theory talked about these things called orbits and energy levels where the electrons were stuck in these different orbits surrounding the nucleus. It's still very similar to what we, what we know to be true now, but instead of using the word orbits, we now term it as orbitals. Very slight difference, but what the orbitals stand for to us is that these are not set in, they're not tracks like a solar system or a train track. Instead, orbitals are just areas where electrons are most likely located. They're there 99% of the time. So I always think about it like a school building. You know, most of the time that you're in the school building, you're either on the first floor, the second floor, or the third floor, but you're not stuck in those places. You know, if you want to stay in the stairwell, you have the freedom. But really, the stairwell is just where you're passing through. So the orbitals would be similar to the floors where that's where you're spending 99% of your time. But we also know that there's an uncertainty principle, which tells us that we cannot determine the exact location of an electron. We can just guess it very, very well. We can get it right 99% of the time, but we can't definitely locate it because it's not stuck in a specific spot. 
So orbitals, we can describe them a few different ways. And we use what we call three quantum numbers to, de to kind of define or describe these orbitals. Where are they? What size are they? What do they look like? What shape are they?